In August 2017, an article was published in the journal Third World Quarterly. The article, titled The Case for Colonialism, was written by Dr. Bruce Gilley, who holds a PhD in politics from Princeton University and a master's in philosophy and economics from the University of Oxford, and who, according to the PSU staff directory, is an associate professor of political science. His research centers on democracy, legitimacy, climate change, and global politics, and he's a specialist in the comparative politics of China and Asia. The paper has been met with the usual progressive backlash, which includes calls for Dr. Gilly to be fired and his paper to be retracted from the journal. A change.org petition was created earlier this week to get the journal to retract the paper, but the petition has yet to reach its goal. In the paper, Dr. Gilly argues that not all colonialism was bad and that much of it actually led to better lives of those being colonized, but furthermore that most of the atrocities that have been blamed on colonialism would have, or at least could have, happened in the same area without colonialism and in many cases likely would have been much worse. Of course, we don't know for sure since we can't change the past. However, we can look to other similar regions under similar conditions to make those conclusions. He also argues that many post-colonialism countries have been on a slow decline since independence, and that the most successful are the ones who had the greatest amount of nation-building done before the colonizers left. However, Dr. Gilly doesn't seem to be delusionally optimistic about colonialism, he seems well aware of the potential for problems, but what's important to keep in mind is exactly what Dr. Gilly is advocating for. He's not saying that we should go out and start conquering lands and claiming territories through conquest. When Gilly uses the term colonialism, he acknowledges the fact that what he is saying by colonialism isn't necessarily what others mean when they say it. In the paper, Gilly argues that we must reclaim colonialism and abandon the practice of dismissing any political concept simply because it could be called colonialism but also that his approach would be better than using a new or different term because if we have an accurate historical account of things, then we can learn from the successes and failures of the past. Ultimately, he seems to be making the case for countries to go in and help third world countries to be more like Western capitalist democracies. And for that, he's been labeled, that's right, you guessed it, a racist, which is quite funny when you think about it. He is saying that rather than taking an America first nationalist policy like Donald Trump, we should have a more globalist policy that extends the rights and freedoms of our first world nations to more places and more people, which doesn't seem very racist to me. And while one could try and argue that he is exhibiting soft bigotry, it must be kept in mind that we're talking about countries, not races. And second, that there are some countries out there that can't seem to get their shit together. So he isn't generalizing any particular group of people, but rather addressing specific instances of nations that have been and continue to be failing to bring prosperity to the people of those specific nations. And to be honest, I don't fully agree with him on all this. It seems to me like these things aren't really our problem, although I'm sure others would claim that I'm racist for thinking that way. But ultimately, I'm not informed enough to know exactly how good or bad all this would turn out. However, I'm not here to address Gilly's claims but rather address the reactionary criticism and claims of racism, which, after reading the paper, I can say, if Gilly holds such racist views, they do not appear to be present in the paper if they exist at all. But ultimately, my problem with these ideas is that they seem to too greatly allow for authoritarianism, as well as create more reliance on multinational corporations and centralized governing bodies and less on local governments. However, Gilly addresses some of this in his paper, as well as the fact that the paper itself isn't really a call for action or suggestion of specific policies, but rather a call for a paradigm shift in how we view colonialism. Could the power associated with colonialism be abused? Certainly. But again, Dr. Gilly makes no call to action. Rather, he is simply making the case to evaluate this on its own merit, which means we can discuss and work out the details before we ever decide to move forward, so there's no need to condemn the paper for that alone. Gilly doesn't solve the problems, but he doesn't claim to, nor does he claim to have all the answers. And it would seem that Gilly is also aware of the potential for problems in these areas, and doesn't seem entirely set on these ideas, but rather wants us to be more open to the idea that some past events can be dissected in such a way as to separate the positive and negative effects, and from there we can select the things that worked, and ultimately improve and perhaps save lives, while also setting up controls to prevent the things that didn't work, like abuse, violence, and subjugation. Dr. Gilly also includes the super-woke quote about colonialism and feminism. In a brutally patriarchal society, for instance, access to justice for women may have been more important than the protection of indigenous land rights, which may be part of the patriarchy, as Andreski argues was the case for women in northern Nigeria under colonialism. Well, at least he's not a goddamn misogynist. 
No, but in all seriousness, I think he is making a fairly good point. If people are being enslaved or oppressed, wouldn't it be a good thing to try and intervene in a way that'll help the people being oppressed, especially if the majority of those people would welcome it? For instance, if we could help countries that perform female genital mutilation become more economically successful, but require the end of the practice of female genital mutilation, should we consider that a bad thing? Should we say, no, don't help those women, and who cares about their economic prosperity of those people? We must instead preserve their culture. It's their right to mutilate people. Who are we to take that away from them? Of course not. Although we may decide it's not our responsibility to help, but the main problem with the idea that we must preserve such cultural practices is that the ones who want to preserve the culture are most likely not the victims of the mutilation. And those getting mutilated probably don't want to preserve that culture. But the mutilators are the ones with the power in society, so why should we care what they want to preserve, when instead we could help actual victims who have actually been mistreated? And again, we may decide it's not our responsibility to help, but in what way would wanting to help be qualified as racism? The answer, of course, is only in a narrow-minded view where colonialism is a European and therefore white practice executed on non-white countries. But it's important to keep in mind the current national climate. White countries are not the only economically successful countries. So, for example, would it be racist to say that China could learn a lot about economic prosperity from Japan? What about if I said that theocracies in the Middle East should learn from their more secular neighbors how to handle human rights issues? Would that be racist? Is it racist to condemn the practice of pushing gays off roofs because it's just their culture? If the answer is no, then why would it magically become racist for a melting pot like the U.S. to do some of the things like that? And again, to be clear, I'm not saying that I agree that we should intervene in these kinds of ways, but rather that it's not racist to suggest that these approaches could yield some benefit to the people of colonialized countries. Millions of people moved closer to areas of more intensive colonial rule, sent their children to colonial schools and hospitals, went beyond the call of duty in positions in colonial governments, reported crimes to colonial police, migrated from non-colonized to colonized areas, fought for colonial armies, and participated in colonial pra political practices, all relatively voluntary acts. Throughout history, people have moved closer to colonized areas to gain access to more resources the same way many people immigrate to areas that are economically prosperous, such as the U.S., Canada, Europe, and Australia. And it seems to me that there are three things we can do in face with the challenge of helping people in the third world. First, we could let them into our nations, which has certain costs and certain benefits. Second, we could go to their country and try and change things for the better. Or third, we can do nothing and say it's not our problem. It also seems like... It is becoming a trend to label anyone who doesn't agree with an open borders policy a racist, which is the case with Dr. Gilly, because rather than being some racist manifesto, it's in fact a well-reasoned paper about how we can do more to help people in the third world other than simply letting in more immigrants. Which, to be clear, I'm relatively pro-immigration. I'm not pro-open borders, but in a weird way, I sort of want to be. I have a little bit of ingrained hippie that I can't quite shake, but pragmatically I know that open borders create too many problems. However, allowing more skilled workers in and more students who can presumably get an excellent education then return home to improve the lives and economies of their home countries, I think is a good thing, as well as bring culture and ideas with them so long as they don't conflict with the laws of the land, and more importantly, they can learn from Western culture and hopefully bring some of those ideas back with them which I think will lead to more successful nations. But maybe that's just my own bias talking. After all, I'm a firm believer in Western democratic capitalism. But when Dr. Gilly uses the word colonialism, he's not talking about killing people. He's not talking about enslaving people. He isn't talking about raping the land of its resources and leaving the people impoverished. In fact, quite the opposite. Dr. Gilly is making an argument that some practices that he believes should rightfully be called colonialism can actually help the lives of the people in those countries. It can do this by fostering a nation that practices equality for all, including minorities and women, access to food and clean water, education, medicine, and he seems to believe that this can be accomplished without destroying the native culture. And I think this makes sense. The only way this wouldn't be theoretically possible is for any culture or set of values that are incompatible with this objective. So, for instance, a culture or practice that treats women like chattel would be incompatible with a legal system that creates equality for all. But we must ask ourselves if such cultures are even worth preserving to begin with. But as long as they are compatible, then it is at least worth considering whether or not there are practical ways to implement such policies. However, even if there are practical ways, we must still ask if we should do it. Is the benefit greater than the cost to us? If so, then great. 
If not, then are we morally responsible? If so, then we should probably do it as well. And if not, then we probably shouldn't, or at least we should not expect anyone to pay for it who doesn't want to. In other words, we should not increase taxes to help other countries at the cost of our own, because our government's job is to serve the people of its nation. So I don't think we should be making people pay to enrich the lives of other nations at the expense of our own nations or our own people. Unless there's a clear benefit to the people paying for it, or those people are morally obligated to do so. The paper also isn't advocating for ruling with an iron fist. In fact, it claims that colonization can only be achieved successfully with the consent of a majority of the people being colonized. The rapid spread and persistence of Western colonialism has very little force relative to the population and area concerned is prima facie evidence of the acceptance by subject populations compared to the feasible alternatives. The preservers, facilitators, and collaborators of colonialism, as Abernathy show, far outnumber the resistors, at least until very late. Imperial expansion was frequently the result not just of European push, but also of indigenous pull. And any colonial relationship requires a high degree of acceptance from the local population. Perhaps this explains why post-Cold War interventions have sought to emphasize their participatory and consensual nature in contrast with an alleged illegitimate and coercive imposed colonialism. So we can see that Dr. Gilly isn't advocating for violence or subservient rule or anything like that. In fact, his main suggestion is for countries to lease out a portion of land to developed nations that can set up that land like a colony. In 2009, the economist Paul Romer, who became the World Bank's chief economist in 2016, suggested that rich nations build charter cities in poor countries. Under this model, largely empty land is leased to foreign nations or groups of nations so that their sovereignty allows a modern enclave to grow up, as was the case in Hong Kong. This tiny British colony, according to Romer, did more to reduce world poverty than all of the aid programs that we've undertaken in the last century. New colonies solve the three challenges above nicely. For local populations, they are legitimate because citizens choose to move there, escaping worse situations, and because their governments agree to the terms. They are potentially attractive to Western states because for conservatives, they are low risk and self-financing, while for liberals, they are acts of justice. Finally, charter cities could be effective, which was Romer's main concern in developing the idea because they have a blank slate to translate home institutions without having to work with rotten local ones. So ultimately, maybe Gilly's paper is the right path to take, and maybe not, but the discussion is not racist. It has also been claimed that the paper lacks academic rigor, and that's why it should get removed, but it passed the peer review process, which means either the journal thinks it did a good job, or the journal messed up, or the journal is paid to play garbage. But if it's the second option, then they would have gladly posted a retraction without a petition once they realized their mistake. And if it's the third option, then who cares? Pay-to-play journals are often full of nonsense, lacking any scientific or academic rigor, and while it is a problem, this particular paper shouldn't be any more of a problem than any other paper published in a shady journal. And that leaves us with the final option, which is that the journal found the paper to be of acceptable quality, even if they didn't agree with everything in the paper. Science and history aren't decided in the courtrooms or by signing petitions, so if you think Dr. Gilly is so terribly wrong, then the best thing anyone can do is to write their own paper about colonialism, citing experts and scholars and relevant information on the topic, and using real-world examples to build a case against Dr. Gilly's hypothesis, then get the paper published in a peer-reviewed journal. Now, obviously, most people won't have the time or capacity to or motivation to do any of that, but all it would take is one academic to go through the paper point by point and identify all the flaws and inaccuracies in his argument. That is, unless Dr. Gilly is correct, then it won't be so easy. So what do you think? Is there a case for colonialism, or is this just racist nonsense? Let me know what you think by leaving a comment and rating this video. And if you enjoy my work, please subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching, and remember to never stop questioning.